good afternoon. Um, let me, since it's the first talk after the, the lunch, let me, uh, let me lower the bar a little bit and tell you that you don't need to know anything about bad personality in order to follow this talk. In fact, uh, the main, the starting point of this talk is exactly that there is no agreed upon uh, uh, version of bad personality, and in fact, there are uh, different versions which here are called cultures. So, I call them cultures exactly uh, borrowed from this man, uh, but some of you have recognized him or were anticipating that he was part of the uh, motivation for this talk. So this is C.P. Snow, who more than 50 years ago became quite uh, influential in drawing this distinction between the cultures of sciences and humanities. And also going further, further on and arguing that this is in fact very detrimental for, for the modern world. And uh, how much more modest goal here today, uh, not to delineate the general uh, intellectual landscape, but talk about these two, cult uh, two cultures, two other cultures within the research field of uh, powers and other. So, this is an important field within behavioral sciences, notably between economics and psychology. And let me spend some time in uh, defining what culture means for me. So, I take it to mean broadly an approach to research, so bad rationality, this is our topic, that includes a number of different things which are related but they're not the same. So, the first kind of thing is uh, technical aspects of this research. So, there could be empirical evidence uh, about the rationality of people. There could also be models of the rationality of people. And also, there could be some storytelling aspects, uh, which, roughly speaking, is something that enables the researchers, but also policymakers, also the public, researchers from outside the field of bio rationality, to have a conversation about my personality and to keep it going. Um, so, putting different commitments and different practices together in terms of how a researcher develops technical aspects and storytelling aspects to learn my personality, this is what I mean by culture. Uh, and the main argument, the one argument I will develop is the following, that indeed there exists two different cultures from bio-nationality and they, importantly, they lead to different approaches for policy and as you will see, this is in fact very relevant today. Uh, let me make a couple of caveats. Often when people, when, when I present this work, people try to guess which specific researchers I have in mind and to try to box them in in one or two different cultures. But I think this is counterproductive, of course, going beyond the fact that some researchers fit more or less deeply into the two boxes. But, for example, Amos Tversky, which is a key thing in the development of decision-making and balance analogy, in fact, could be, could be put into both of the cultures. And the second uh, point I would like to make, I will make after the second caveat, I will make after I talk about these two cultures. So I took the liberty of giving them names, and the first one I called idealistic. And here I would like to point out that I don't, I wouldn't wish to have any uh, moral or socio-political, economic, uh, political connotations to this work. So I call this idealistic, only for the reason that I see this culture as pursuing uh, a minimum departure from the ideals in the strict sense of the world that appear in the, in the standard neoclassical economic approach. So, the ideals of omniscience and optimization of a decision maker who pretty much knows everything that there is to know for making a decision and pretty much is able to process all that he knows in the best possible way. Uh, this is uh, an ideal decision maker, an idealized decision maker, and there is one culture by rationality which. Uh, exactly tries to stay as close to that ideal as possible. Of course, we have to give away some of it on the line of empirical evidence that people do not know everything, they do not even act as if they know everything, and they cannot do all the necessary processing. But nevertheless, it tries to stay as close to this ideal as possible. Uh, 
what's in the parentheses of the plane to a more sense to, to, the, to the specifics of non but I will explain a little bit later during the talk. Uh, so, there is, for example, still a utility function. That's a commitment that's very close to the ideal of the classical economics, but it's changed a little bit by saying that people weigh the probabilities. They don't use the actual real sort of set values, but they weigh it. Or, there's still a utility function in the game, but this is not only uh, maximizing our own developing, but also taking into account some social considerations, social preferences, as they call it. By, for example, introducing inequity aversion. You feel bad if you have more than other people, and they would be envious of them. Um, the, the second culture is pragmatic, and now I use this term exactly in, in the dictionary sense. It's, uh, it's the antithesis of calling something idealistic. So this, uh, this culture, the main premise of it is that sometimes people ignore information, so not only they cannot know everything, but sometimes they even choose to ignore some of the things they know. So it's very different from being omniscient, as different as it gets. And instead of optimizing, they use some simple rules of thumb for achieving, they're happy to just achieve some satisfactory outcome, even only for the reason that they couldn't even know if they have an optimal outcome. Even if they have achieved it, they couldn't know. So they might as well be happy with having a simple satisfactory outcome. Uh, as I said, Ad Amos Tversky is a case of one researcher. This is, again, something for the specialist who uh, would have fit, his work would have fit in both of these cultures in the sense that um, prospect theory is an idealistic moment, uh, model. It's something that's very, very close to expected utility theory. But he also has at least one pragmatic model of decision making, the so-called elimination by aspects. Um, so, as I said, I promised that uh, I will analyze the two different ingredients of its culture, and the first ingredient is the technical aspects. So, I'm going to put up a table here, which is basically the, the whole point about analyzing the technical aspects, and then I'm going to go through some of its, uh, of its parts. So, in fact, maybe you can already see that the so-called definitions of the two cultures that I described they're kind of included in the first three distinctions here. Uh, so what I'm going to do in the next slide, I'm going to analyze by way of a specific example the way that these three distinctions uh, actually affect each other. And the organizing theme will be exactly the distinction between optimizing behavior and satisfying behavior. So this is the example. This is a very narrow kind of decision people sometimes have to make. But nevertheless, it is one of the workhorse of microeconomics and to a large extent to behavioral economics, at least the beginning of behavioral economics. So it's what's often called the risky choice. Of course, choices do not present themselves like that to us in the real world. But the whole point of the theory is that you could make them look like this. So this would mean that there's a 50% chance that you receive 10 euros and a 50% chance that you receive nothing. So you throw a coin and you either get 10 or you get zero. And a participant in an experiment like that would have to, be, uh, have to make a choice between this risky prospect or gamble, as it's often called, and a sure thing, which would, mean, which would be here that you receive four euros with certainty. So it's evidence from such kind of investigations that have led to prospect theory and some alternatives. So, Let's analyze for these kinds of tasks the difference between a model of the idealistic culture and the pragmatic culture. And the models will come in here. And the first one is indeed prospect theory. So this is a very symbolic representation of it, no equations, just the two functions. So uh, here on top, you see the value function, which is nothing else than the utility function. And this basically says every time you receive an outcome, you transform it to utility, and you do this for gains, and you do this for losses. And it's not a diagonal, so you transform them. Um, the lower part is that you do the same thing about the probabilities involved in a gamble. This is the real probability, so to say, and somehow as a person, this means something else to you. So, so what I would like to, to point out that the first three ingredients that I have in the table about the characteristics of an idealistic model obtained here. So these models have to do something with optimization. So after 
you have done these transformations, you somehow put them together, pretty much in the same utility time probability form, and then you choose the two gambles that maximizes the expected utility. They don't call it expected utility here, but it's very, very close. The primitives, the theoretical primitives, are the same. A utility function and a probability function. They're just transformed here. Uh, which is, in fact, in a way, more work. But anyway, um, the other point is uh, that this is not claimed to be a description of how actually people do it. It's claimed to be, in Milton Friedman's famous as-if sense, uh, the representation of the outcome that people would get if they really had a utility function and probability function, and they integrated, they put them together. So it's not meant to exactly say what the underlying psychology is. It's just an as-if representation. So now I would like you to contrast it to this model, which is again a model for the risky choice task you saw before, the choice between these two gambits. And it is what I would like to call a pragmatic model. So first of all, there's no pretense of optimization here. You just go through a simple sequential process which cannot guarantee that you optimize anything, except if you mean that in a very trivial sense. But for example, it guarantees, as you can see here, that you do not choose the gamble that will have a much inferior uh, worst case scenario than, uh, than the other gamble. So it's a satisfactory outcome, but not an optimal outcome. Another difference is that this thing here, uh, theoretically speaking, they're very rooted in axioms of decision making as, for example, transitivity, the independence axiom, and so on. This, uh, and they were, and it's possible to represent prospect theory as a, an equivalent set of logical axioms. There's no such thing here. Uh, the way these researchers developed this, this heuristic model, this pragmatic model, was by first using an empirical finding, which was that often people make a choice by using only one reason. You see it? So you ask one question, and you use only this reason, this attribute, this Q, this feature. These are different jargons in different disciplines for using one reason. And then you can make a choice. Of course, you may also use two reasons or three. But sometimes you only use one or two. In the prospect theory example, you always use all the information. So the starting point here is more bottom up. You start from what's known about human psychology and you build a precise mathematical model. Here's more top-down, you, you start from the, from the axioms. And something else I would like to point out is that, uh, as I said, this is not meant to be, strictly speaking, a description of any underlying psychological process. Well, this is meant to be so. First you do this, then you do this, then you do this. It's a process, something that unfolds over time. Let me continue now with the second set of differences for the um, that they were in the table of the tactical aspects. And those can be grouped together under the idea of testing a model. I'm going to use another example of a decision-making task. And that's it. This is something, as a specialist, again, you may have seen it. It's called the ultimatum bargaining game. So what happens here, this guy who's the proposer has access uh, to, to something. <laughs> Let's say here, for convenience, that it's a, a unit pie of money. Let's say that it's, it's 100 euros. He makes an offer to you. You are the responder. He offers X out of this unit pi. And then you have basically one choice. Either you accept it, in which case what he suggested is going to happen. So you're going to get X and he's going to get 1 minus X. And if you reject it, both of you are going to get 0. Okay? That's the ultimatum bargaining. And now in this task, which is again schematic, and you can say that it's not so interesting for the real context decision, decisions we have to make, Still, a lot of the evidence in behavioral game theory is based on, on tasks like this. And I'm going to present again, as I did before, an example of uh, an idealistic and a pragmatic model so that I can highlight to you the differences. Um, that's the first model. The first thing to notice is, again, that we have utility functions. Uh, what mostly I want to, uh, to focus on here is the, the role of parameters. So there's this symbol here, this alpha which is a free parameter. So, and there, there's also the beta, which is also a free parameter. So these are the utility functions of the responder, of the proposer. And uh, basically, the, the main point is that they both try to optimize their utility, but the utility does not only include 
the money that they will receive, but include some other feelings, <laughs> so to say, or some other preferences about how much more you want to get than the other guy. That's all you need to know from this whole thing. So it's again an attempt to pursue a minimal departure from the, class, from the neoclassical notion of rationality, but it is still minimum. You still have a utility function and so on. Furthermore, what's important for these differences is A, that you have a free parameter. Now this is something that's not in the slide, but I can tell you that it is like that. Typically in applications, these parameters are not estimated once and for all from other experiments, but in every new experiment they're estimated again. So there's a sense in which that means that the focus of this culture is not on predicting new phenomena, but explaining phenomena that have already been obtained. So the focus is on explanation, not on predicting new data. Uh, and something else that also doesn't appear here for some reason, which I don't exactly want to speculate on, but uh, this kind of work usually when it tests competitively different models, only tests models like this, models of the idealistic culture, which again have these characteristics of utility functions parameterized by free parameters. And here's a contrast. So this is a pragmatic model, and it does pretty much always the opposite. First, it doesn't have free parameters, so a possible rule of thumb that the proposer would use is to just offer half, 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 then kind of counting on the fact that uh, the responder will probably have to accept it. It seems fair, quote unquote. Another possible rule would be to offer the largest possible thing that you can get away from. Given that the responder realizes that you as the proposer have more power than him, he may accept it if you offer him 40 euros out of the 100 rather than 50. I mean, you have to get a little more because you have the power. And so on and so forth. There's another rule here for the responder and so on. So there's no free parameters here. Um, and also a, another point is that because there are no free parameters, the models can be thought of as always predicting new data. So data that they have not seen would not change the way the model is calibrated. So in that sense, it is always a prediction. And something that also happened to be the case, again, I don't want to speculate, is that Models working on this tradition, typically they, they employ more competitive testing that involves both uh, idealistic and pragmatic models. Um, so this concludes what I wanted to say about the technical aspects. And let me uh, finish the talk by going to the second part, which is the storytelling aspects, which I think are very, very, very interesting. So virtues such as explaining and predicting are examples of what Mary Morgan from the LSE would call the ultimate services that a model can provide, but also they are intermediate services of models. And this somehow, some, somewhat vague, here I call something like a story. Other people have used that word before. And as I said, the story is you take together the data, you take together the models, and you create a narrative that can be used to talk with other scientists that are not exactly working technically in the same field, talk to the lay public, talk to policymakers, and so on. And this is clearly very, very important for a science like economics, where the theories that are out there uh, influence everybody's behavior. So this is a story. And I'm going to argue that each one of the two cultures that I've been talking about, the idealistic and the pragmatic culture, map into a story. So the story of the pragmatic culture goes a little bit like this. Of course, now, I, I would have to say that people who are working in these models wouldn't exactly accept this thread, or they may not. But it's something that I think makes, uh, give the spirit of the kinds of conversations that are usually based on the idealistic culture. So the idea is that people systematically behave irrationally, for example, by violating the independence axiom. They shouldn't do so, because if they do so, they do not maximize their utility. And in fact, moreover, they are able of uh, behaving rationally, but they cannot learn how to do that. So still, they need, to, they need to keep trying to do that. So I went out on a limb here and called this a frustrating story, because it just says you're not good enough, but you should be. <laughs> so you should keep trying, but you're never going to make it. So this is frustrating. Uh, the story that I think somehow is implied and usually ac accompanying a pragmatic model of bound rationality is a story that basically says, yes, you're not always perfect, but there are 
different tools, the different rules of thumb you can use in different situations, and they will lead to a good outcome. All you need to do is to be educated in using the right tool in the right situation. So, equally, I went out on the limb here and called that a more empowering story. At least there's hope you could do it. And I have another table here that summarizes the two things that I just said about the two stories. They're the, the, they're the first two uh, rows. This is the gist of the story. You're not doing so well, but you should keep trying. <laughs> you could do well if you only learn how to choose. This is how you as a consumer of these models may react, being frustrated or feeling that there's hope. And one of the arguments I developed in the paper is that these ideas uh, lead to this policy approaches that I'm sure you've all heard. There is a, there's a nice article by journalist Michael Bond in Nature that he almost goes as far as calling these two policies, well, nudge you've heard anyway already, which is you cannot learn, so I as an authority am going to push you a little bit towards doing the right thing even if you don't know what you're doing, and educating, which is the alternative to that. Um, this is the take home message. And this is a little bit why I wanted to engage in this exercise. I think it's not good for the people who work in bound rationality to think that everything is the same. It's even worse for people who try to borrow research on bound rationality to think that everybody said the same thing. And if we acknowledge this tension, we may be able to learn, each culture may be able to learn from each other. And as a way to facilitate the discussion, let me put up the two main results, so to say, the table on the two cultures and the technical differences, and the table on the two cultures and the storytelling differences. Thank you. Now questions? I view the distinction between the idealist and the pragmatic cultures as more or less a distinction between the normative I'm not sure you agree, but let, yeah. let me try this on you. Okay. And then I want to say that, um, I mean, this idea of non rationality presumes that we have a fixed idea of what rationality is. And in the, in the literature, it's been related to the classical economics, we have the phenomenal models and so on, and so on the ideas of what, what rationality is. On the other hand, there is a tradition, I think, ignorance is, is one of the say that, well, we've got the wrong idea of rationality. I mean, if you take an evolutionary point of view, you would get a totally different view on rationality. I mean, this idea that's used in decision theory and, and, and uh, behavioral economics is, is, is very narrow view of rationality. It's not a question, it's more and more it's a provocation. No, no, it's a provocation. No, it's a good comment. I mean, I, I was, of course, both cultures have a descriptive and a and a normative or even prescriptive aspect to them. Yes. Uh, here, I, the, the first part, the technical differences, I think they, I mean them completely about the descriptive part, building a model of what a person does. And I think if you see it like that, there is meaning in the first table, in the, in the table. I mean, you could try to extend and slightly modify the, the table to something more normative. The second table, I guess, a sense, especially in the end, where it has to do with the policy, it's more prescriptive. Um, a final comment I would make is that the idealistic uh, culture, I think, would take the normative thing more seriously. They would say, we have norms, the reasons why you have them. Thought went into them, you know, von Neumann, Morgenstern, Savage, other people that thought about it. So we shouldn't throw them away. And you could say that the pragmatic says, yes, this was interesting, but somehow it doesn't lead to better decisions. So there is this, the, the normative issue and how much you accept some norms underlies how these were developed, but I, I, I personally didn't get so much into, into the normative here. That's, that's, that's my...
Let me quickly respond. I mean, I guess that shows some of the limitations of this analysis. There's more. There's more cultures. Barton Lipman at Boston University has a model of band rationality where it is exactly that you as a decision maker do not understand or do not derive or are not aware of all the logical implications of your theory of the world. So this is not exactly here. I mean, it is in a sense closer to the idealistic culture because it's tied to these traditional norms of, of logic. In that sense, the way I would see it, he, here in a way I'm trying to make a model of the researcher. So I would say, where does the researcher get inspiration from? That's in a way my primary reason for the labels idealistic or pragmatic. So if they get more inspiration from the norms of logic and probability, I think it's more of an idealistic modeler. And if they don't, and, and as, as it was pointed out before, in the Gigeranger tradition, if rationality is essentially replaced by functionality and making it in the real world, then I think it's reasonable to say that such a decision maker wouldn't care so much about whether they're logical, or, but whether they, they somehow can function. And this is what I try to capture by, by the pragmatic. Yeah, yeah, understood. Yeah, yeah, understood. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. We might have time for a very short mm -hmm. question. But if we don't, then... That's okay. Yeah.